This talk is about reflexivity in language in relation to cybernetics. The title of this talk is Cybernetic Tools. Uh, the glyph you are looking at is uh, symbolic for the theme of this talk. It is a world which is observing itself and bringing itself into being through its own observation. We live in language that is identical to its own meta-language. Everyone knows this. It is the basic cybernetic insight that marks the ability of the speaker of any human language to know that he or she can, in that language, comment on what is said in that language. It is the basic cybernetic turn that allows communication and freedom of thought. This stance of freedom of language means that the speaker is responsible for all distinctions that she makes. This stance of freedom of language means that it is possible to formulate paradoxical structures, such as the book listing all the books in the library that do not list themselves, paradoxical structures that have been around for a long time, and paradoxical structures equivalent to the Russell paradox. The stance of freedom of meta-language is what makes it possible to create formal languages that possibly are logically consistent. It is in the cleft of going from language to meta-language that distinctions appear. And it is in the smoothing and, and direct connection of meta-language and language that distinctions disappear. By Gödel, we know that even if one does create a formal language that is logically consistent, it will admit a twist of meta-language embedding within it that makes it incomplete. Thus, we are always thrown back to the basic cybernetic turn of language that is our birthright as human beings. This means that the cybernetic discussion is truly inherent in any honest disciplinary study. The participant and her world are intertwined. I take the foregoing to be basic principles for cybernetics. These principles become the tools of cybernetics as we apply them to a spectrum of situations. This slideshow focuses on the principles and how the change of language inherent in them must be examined. Heinz von Forster said, I am the observed relation between myself and observing myself. And this sentence is occurring in ordinary language, and at least to those of us used to cybernetic talk, this is understandable and, and transparent in the form of its speech. And yet, we can translate it into something very simple symbolically. For example, if the right angle mark that is written below is thought of as observing, and if the juxtaposition of two terms, like I and I with a mark over it, are regarded as the link between or the relationship between, then the symbolic statement I equals the observation of the link between I and the observation of I is a literal translation of Heinz's sentence. But if we uh, at least initially look at it in this symbolic language, it will seem strange to us, and it will not resonate quite the same way as it happens in ordinary language. And this indicates the remarkable um, skein of relations that is occurring in ordinary language that allows it to be its own meta-language, that this is actually a subtle matter, even though it's an, a matter that is quite obvious to us. It is the core of the cybernetic turn, and it requires and needs as much investigation as we can give it. The key to understanding observing systems is to take to heart the recursive nature of language. 
You, the observer, are coalesced with the mark that you observe. You are coalesced with the language that you speak. The key circularity that constitutes cybernetics is that language can be equal to and encompass its own meta-language. This is our natural freedom of language and it is the basis of the freedom of thought and freedom of speech. All systems of thought place restrictions on what can be said. In consciously recognizing those restrictions, we regain or gain the freedom of thought needed to go forward. Reflexive language creates worlds. One of the potentialities of cybernetics is that there is a long history of working with the essential circularity of processes and indeed circular reasoning to understand the nature of recursive situations at all levels. We are just at the beginning of understanding the possibilities in such worlds. Within the reflexive context, we can rebuild and extend science to include the world as conversation a conversation that constructs itself and a world. In a reflexive domain, actions and objects are identical. If X is an actor in a reflexive domain, then X can act on itself to produce a new actor, XX, or X raised to the X power, X reflecting on X. And I wish to look at the language, the syntax of the language in that form. I want to write A to the B to mean that A is reflecting on B, A is thinking about B. And I let L be our common language. And then I say that L reflecting on L is L. L with its meta possibilities is L itself. And I write it diagrammatically as a line meeting another line and going under it and the line that goes underneath the other line, the overline is the reflector and the underline is the reflectant. A to the B comes out. And then a little curl represents the turn of language. L operating on L comes back and becomes L in a little curl. Well, uh, we hope that the topological pictures will help in thinking about this. And we can make models in this symbolic form where we use nothing more than just some letters for reflection. For example, we could have K, we'll call him the king, who is reflecting on reflection. K is reflecting on X reflecting on X. He's reflecting on reflection. And G is a person, a sub-personage of the king, who reflects on X, but whenever G reflects on X, it is the king reflecting on X, reflecting on X. And then G can reflect on himself. Personages arise in this language, this very simple language. G can reflect on himself and becomes the king reflecting on G, reflecting on himself. So if we let Alice be G reflecting on the king, reflecting on himself, then Alice is equal to the king reflecting on Alice. Alice is a fixed point of the king. Alice is a dream of the red king. Alice is the dream of the red king. The apparent nonsense of Lewis Carroll becomes theorems in the reflexive language. Going back to this, you see that we are talking about eigenform, a familiar topic in cybernetics. Fixed points of transformations. Fixed points of transformations arise in the reflective domain, just as the king gives rise to Alice. And objects are tokens for eigenbehaviors. That was Heinz's title. Objects become the eigenforms and the behavior that gives rise to those eigenforms gives rise to the objects in the eyes of the observer. It is not just that the paradoxical or fantastical can appear as eigenforms. The objects of our common experience are imaginary. They are eigenforms for our eigenbehavior. It's not to say that our experience is imaginary, but that the objects, the apparent coalitions and apparent 
forms that are recognized by us are our own constructions. They are the constructions of our powerful imagination. Our mandate is to take up our language and its reflexivity and build the world anew. Here is a little investigation. I have decided to allow Alice to be a function of the king, because after all, it was for that king that we produced an Alice. And then you see Alice for that king is that king reflecting on Alice. And we could even let the king be Alice, and then we would have Alice reflecting on Alice. It's the same as Alice reflecting on Alice, reflecting on Alice, and the, and the reflection turn similar to language as its own meta language has occurred at a certain level here, just in the syntax. And it is very interesting to see that it might happen in the syntax. If you tried to get that language and meta language are the same by only by syntax, I think you would fail. I think you need semantics. But in the syntax, some reflections of it will occur. And they will even occur in the topological syntax. You'll see it here on this page, that A bumps into A and becomes A to the A. And then another curl becomes A to the A to the A, and rounding about becomes equal to the other one, A to the A. And so a little double curl is what's involved in what happened to Alice. And that double curl is actually topologically reduced to nothing if you just watch what happens. You start with a little circle and it curls on itself and slides through itself and pulls apart and lo and behold an entity and an opposite entity have come out. A particle and an antiparticle, a one and a minus one have come out and that is the reflexive turn that we found in the syntax. A reflection of language being equal to its own meta-language in a very elementary way. But it is that reflective property that bits of this can happen in the syntax and very significantly and in the topological syntax that uh, allows us to grasp what is ungraspable and to use what is really beyond our ken. And so we investigate back and forth between the deep meaning of language being its own meta-language and the external remarkable reflexive syntaxes that let us play with it directly. It is not enough to assert that language is equal to its own meta-language. How does this come about? What stabilizes our ability to speak, to reflect, to think, to be observers of the systems that we are? One way to investigate it is via recursive topological language. Perhaps this is the beginning of Leibniz's dream of a universal formal language all over again. But however it is done, we must converse. Wittgenstein said, the limits of my language are the limits of my world. He also said, whereof one cannot speak, one must remain silent. But that does not mean that one must remain silent. It just means that one must engage in playful and in significant speech. So that the observer and his world are one. Thank you.